Let's go ahead and get started, please. Uh, just uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, uh, we've uh, been blessed over, over the years. We've had uh, one year where we had six graduates and all six of them were young ladies. And uh, they keep popping up. And uh, uh, let's, re let's remember uh, Bailey White leaves this week to work as the an intern at uh, this summer at Central Church of Christ in, in Winter Haven, Florida. Um, also, Hannah Kellum uh, is uh, the girls intern at the, the church in Fayetteville, Arkansas this uh, summer. And uh, uh, Catherine Taylor is uh, returning from a mission trip in Peru this week. So let's keep him in our prayers. Also, uh, I read a, a card from Kathy and Don Robertson. It's on the the, bill, uh, the, the board out there, and it's got their uh, their address in Starkville. They're living in Starkville now. Uh, they got so much Mississippi State in them. That's why. So, uh, but they have their address. Send send them a bunch of cards so they'll really feel bad about not being here. They were here for 43 years. So, uh, but also uh, let's keep. Uh, 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 Miss McCurin uh, 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 passed away yesterday, and, and uh, let's let's keep uh, them in our prayers and uh, the Wallaces and and uh, and in the loss of her. Um, one other announcement: uh, uh, sometimes people take sabbaticals. Uh, 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 Susan McNutt uh, is coming back. Oh, uh, and. Uh, Troy's coming back too, by the way. Uh, we uh, we talked with Troy as an eldership, and we said, "Well, you just took a sabbatical. You went over into Hamilton, Mississippi, to help the church. Tornado hit there. You helped the church, but now he's come home. The prodigal son has come home to stay." So please, uh, he's, he's, he's our deacon, and, uh, and uh, we love him, and uh, we're thankful that he has come back. And you'll be hearing sermons from him and a lot of different things. So, But here, I want to make sure that everyone here realizes how important it is that you're here. And we're so thankful for your presence here. As an eldership, we love you. and and. And uh, we're so thankful for your presence. And, and we have guests, and, and, and you're special to us. And we want to get to know you better. So please give, give us that privilege and that opportunity to get to know you better. But we're here for one reason, that is to worship God and to do Him, do what we should do in our song, in our prayers, uh, in our service and our fellowship to one another and the way that we live our lives when we leave this place and we should let our light shine. Please bow with me. Holy and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for you. We're thankful that we can call you Father. We're thankful for our high priest, Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit who helps us and is our comforter. Father, we're so uh, overwhelmed when we realize the unbelievable magnificent of you, and we know that you are God and we love you. Help us, Father, to turn our hearts to you, to learn more about you, to know more about Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior and what he means to us. Thank you, Father, for allowing your son to come to this earth, to die, to be buried, and to resurrection, and is sitting at your right hand. We're so thankful for the lesson that we heard this morning, and we look forward to the lesson tonight from Doug. Father, we're blessed in so many ways. We love each other. This is a loving church, this is a praying church, and we pray that we will continue to pray to you for your love and your guidance 
and for that alone. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. If you would please take out a song book and turn to number 180. Number 180. <clears throat>
Dear, kind, loving Heavenly Father, we approach thy throne of mercy at this time, giving thee thanks for the opportunity which has been afforded us to come together and to sing these songs as a praise unto thee, to petition thee in this prayer, and to hear thy word proclaimed this afternoon. We're thankful, Father, for the privilege of being able to assemble and to worship thee without fear from outside forces. We're thankful for the nation for which we live in. And we pray, Father, for those who live in other countries who do not have such privileges as we have. And help us, Father, that we do not take our privilege for granted. We pray, Father, that thou will be with us each and every one of this congregation as we worship thee this evening. Pray that we can sing with the understanding. We pray, Father, that we can pour our hearts out to thee, petition thee in prayer, and thou will be willing and able to hear us. We're thankful for thy presence here with us this afternoon as we sing these songs and petition thee in prayer. We pray, Father, that thou will be with those that have been made mention of today, this morning, those who are sick and in need of our prayers, those who are in nursing homes and other places. We pray, Father, that thou would be with them, be with the doctors, the nurses, be with the families with whom are involved, that thou would give them strength and courage that they may be able to overcome and possibly be back and worship unto thee. We're indeed mindful, Father, of our leadership here at West Main, the elders, and we pray thy blessings upon them. We pray that thou would give them wisdom, pray that they'll be able to make the decisions that are right for the congregation and be uh, in good standing with thee as well. We pray, Father, that thou would be with our local minister here, Brother Doug and Miss Vicki, we pray that thou would bless them as uh, they continue to worship with us and to lead us in the pulpit each and every Sunday. We're thankful for Nathan and his wife as they labor here with us as well with the young people. We pray thy blessings upon them and bless their efforts and the things that they do. We're thankful for each member, Father, of this congregation. Help us all to realize that we need to let our light shine in a lost and dying world so that we can bring glory and honor unto thee. We're thankful, Father, for... Uh, those who are in the foreign fields, who in the mission fields, pray, Father, that thou will be with them as they're away from their native homeland. And pray, Father, that thou will give them strength and give them encouragement and the efforts that they put forth, that souls may be one unto thee. And we pray, Father, that uh, we can help them in whatever ways that we have at our disposal. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for those men and women who are serving our nation and the forces. We pray thy blessings upon them. Pray, Father, that uh, they can uh, serve their time and come home uh, to their families. And we pray, Father, that thou will be with them as they are in harm's way from time to time and bless them in whatever way that thou canst. We are thankful, Father, for thy love and for thy watch care over us, for thy mercy and for thy grace. And pray, Father, that we will uh, use these uh, points to our advantage as Christians that we can let our light so shine that many souls would be influenced by the efforts that we do put forth. Continue with us through this worship service and we pray, Father, the things that we say and do in accordance with thy will. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to mark the invitation song after the lesson this evening, we will sing number 205. Once again, our invitation song will be number 205. Then after you have that marked, if you'll turn over to number 598. 598. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of this song. If it's convenient and you're able, would you please stand as we worship together? <laughs>
Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and they will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is enough. If you have your outline handy, if you'll notice, first of all, the Bible claims that there is a God and a devil, and that there is a hereafter. A hereafter that's just as real as the here. We're not on this earth for very long. You can look around and see that verified on a regular basis. In 1 Samuel 20 and verse 3, my Bible reads David telling Jonathan, but Truly, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Every time we read an obituary, every time we go to the funeral home, every time we look around at a holiday gathering and there's a seat or seats that are empty, when we gather to worship and there's some who no longer are here in this world together with us, But probably, without exception, we do believe that the dead live on somewhere. And here in a Sunday or two, we'll deal with where do the dead go, reflecting our devotional book, our one-word devotional book. But tonight, we look at the word heaven. First of all, heaven is a real place. In John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Twice just now we read where Jesus calls heaven a place. If you'd take just a moment and be cooperative and touch the church pew in front of you, just reach out and touch it. Touch the padding of the pew, maybe the songbook in the rack. Heaven is just as real as what you're now touching. We sometimes spiritualize heaven to the point we forget that it is a touchable place. We just read how the Apostle John tried to describe heaven for us. You can also throw in Revelation chapter 22. 
But the only way he can really succeed at describing heaven to people who've never seen anything like it is to use the idea of what heaven is like. And so he talks about walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of gold, no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no death, a city four square. Your version may say 12,000 furlongs, that equals 1,500 miles long, wide, and high. The Bible talks about our final worship and resting place as being the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse two. The first heaven is where the birds fly and the airplanes fly. The second heaven is what we call outer space where the sun, moon, and stars are and periodically mankind visits. The third heaven is not in the realm of human travel. The third heaven is limitless, infinite space. It's pictured as the home of angels and God. And Hebrews 12 and verse 23 talks about as well as the souls of just men made perfect. Now we have folks watching this worship hour on their computer tonight or their tablet and they can't reach out and touch that pew to know that what they're hearing about and seeing is real, but it's just as real whether right now they can reach out and touch it or not. And tonight I want to tell you about a place where folks will be eternally free from all the problems of this life. You think of a problem or two or five or ten in this world and you won't have them where I'm talking about tonight. There's not even going to be the possibility of having a bad day in heaven. There'll be no depression in heaven, neither economically nor mentally and emotionally. There'll be no false doctrine or false teaching or false teachers in heaven. You won't have to worry about what you hear from the pulpit if there is a pulpit to hear from. And that heaven will be enough. And that's the title of our lesson. Number two, heaven will be full of real people. Not only is heaven a real place, but it will be full of real people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 10, my Bible says, For we must all, A-L-L, all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and also trust are well known in your conscience. We'll have a memory of our life on earth when we get to heaven. If we had forgotten that we ever had a body or ever lived here, it would make it impossible for 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 to be understood here. These real people will be rewarded for real good works that they did on earth. The needy that were fed, clothed, and visited, and so on, according to Matthew chapter 25, 34 through 36. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 2, we have on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, who lived on earth 500 years apart in time. But they were together in the afterlife and 1,500 and 1,000 years after they had died, they still existed and they are summoned to meet with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. And by the way, it seems to me that 
the temporary dwelling place after death for the righteous. We hear the Bible call it paradise. And then after the day of judgment, the righteous will move on to eternity in heaven itself. And I'm not here to judge who's in paradise tonight or who's not. I'll be glad to study that issue out of the Bible with you. But we hear so often accommodative language. We talk about so-and-so has gone on to heaven. My grandpa's gone on to heaven. Well, not, not so. He's gone on to Hades, the realm of the unseen. He's gone on to paradise if he died in the Lord. And then when we breathe our last or lose our mental faculties, our fate is sealed. We'll leave this world and we'll wake up in the hereafter with a real good idea of how our eternity is going to go. Number three, heaven will be a real reunion. I really like this verse in Genesis 25 and verse 8, which says, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Do you have people waiting for you? Do you have people that you long to see? I know we all do. And then there's a very optimistic outlook about a bad situation when King David's baby died in 2 Samuel 12, verses 22 and 23. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Our relationships in heaven, though we will remember our earthly connections, may not mimic exactly the relationships we had with certain people on earth. But I have to believe that we'll be able to remember and appreciate the relationships that we did have. And King David certainly thought so. Heaven will be enough for at least five reasons. Number one, because we shall finally see and be with Jesus. People will stay in a line all night. Or they'll spend all kinds of exorbitant amounts of money to obtain a ticket to see some famous person go to some concert, or be the first to own some kind of material thing. But listen to how the Apostle Paul viewed the reason that he wanted to go on to his reward in Philippians 1, 21 and following. He said, for to me to live is Christ, and die, to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two. Watch it now. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul didn't say that to depart and be with Christ was better. But he did say that to depart and be with Christ was far better for someone ready to meet their maker. Number two, heaven will be enough because we'll once again get to see our loved ones who died before our time. Have you ever been somewhere waiting for a loved one to show up? Maybe at the gates of the airport, you were waiting for them to disembark. You knew this was their flight. You knew they were supposed to be on it. You anticipated the reunion, what it might be like. and 
You'd gone to a lot of trouble and preparation to be there for it. And if you've ever done that, how wonderful it is to anticipate that there will be a welcoming committee beyond imagination to welcome us when we enter paradise in the realm of the unseen. Number three, heaven will be enough because we will finally be through with sin. Some of us have been accountable in the sight of God for decades and decades. Really, uh, seems like a lifetime, practically so. But we'll finally be delivered from this wretched person. Paul says, Romans 7 and verse 24 and 5, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's a rhetorical question. In other words, it has an obvious answer. And the answer is, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So Paul is saying, I'm going to be done with my battle with sin one of these days. When the good Lord comes back and shuts this world down, or when my time on earth is finished. Number four, heaven is enough because finally the Christian gains rest. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 31, the Apostle Paul, in recounting the time and energy that he invested with certain brethren and sistren, said he labored night and day with tears. It seems like the harder you try to do right, the uglier people get with you over stuff that really doesn't matter all that much for all that long. I read Matthew 7 and verse 12, and it's sometimes tempting to change it up a little bit and do unto others as they do unto you. But that's not what the good Lord said. He said to treat people like you want to be treated. And we need to remember that we're not home yet. We're still on the journey. And life is not going to be easy. Life is hectic and life is hard. But let's just keep at it till the brief part we play on the stage of life is finished and the curtain comes down for the final time. One of my great philosophers is expressed in a Johnny Cash song entitled, When I Take My Vacation in Heaven. And the song read, there are those who are taking vacations to the mountains, the lakes, and the sea, where they rest from their cares and their troubles. What a wonderful time that must be. But it seems not my lot to be like them. I must hold through the heat and the cold seeking out the lost sheep on the mountains, bringing wanderers back to the fold. But when I take my vacation in heaven, what a wonderful time that will be, hearing concerts by the heavenly chorus in the face of my Savior I'll see, sitting down on the banks of the river, neath the shade of the evergreen tree there. I'll rest from my burdens forever. Won't you take your vacation with me? Number five, and finally, heaven is enough, for there we'll gain eternal rewards. We're not familiar with eternal rewards. We try to understand it. We try to wish for it. But we really don't have a handle on it because we, we're not touching the eternal on an everyday basis around here. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, my Bible reads, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here it is. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. 
our rewards here don't last very long. Our certificates and our trophies don't mean all that much for all that long. There was a time in my life when practically every weekend I was somewhere running a race. And over the years I accumulated a lot of trophies and certificates. Until a few years ago I began to think about the hereafter and I boxed all those things up, gave them to some of the teachers and said, figure out how to reward your Bible class students and use some of these because I'm done with them. They really, those sorts of things don't last very long. And it won't be long before any of us as God's people hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now here's the question of the hour. Do you really want to go to heaven? Do you really want to go? And if you do, then you'll prove it by the decisions that you make today and tomorrow and if the world's standing the day after that and next week and next month and next year. But one of these days, you and I won't be in the here. We will have entered the hereafter. But today, the number one decision of our life has to be, am I right with God? And right on the heels of that one, what am I going to do about it if I'm not? And so we extend this invitation to give you one final opportunity. It's the only opportunity I know that you'll have to make your wrongs right with God. We'd be glad to pray with you. We'd be glad to assist you in becoming a Christian. If there's any way we can assist you in a spiritual way or any other way for need in your life, let us know what that might be as we stand and sing, Will You Come?
So just a few announcements. Um, <clears throat> our community outreach for the month of May will be collecting wipes and diapers for, uh, for Faith Haven. We just want to remind kit team number three will meet in the library tonight after services to pass out cards. Kit team one will meet after evening services on June the 2nd. Uh, that meal is going to be all American picnic foods. So that sounds exciting. Um, I'll ask that you refer to your bulletin, please, for uh, updates on our, our sick and our prayer list, as well as the, the number of youth announcements that we have. Um, most pressing of those would be uh, the hot Wednesday that we have this Wednesday, May the 29th. Dinner will be at 545. Uh, we have a movie night at The Face on June the 1st. Uh, starting at 6.30, uh, and our service project on June the 4th will be leaving uh, at 8 a.m. from the face. I was given this card, Miss McEwen Services Times. Visitations are from 5 to 7. I believe that says at Holland. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, the service will be Wednesday at 11 a.m. also at Holland. Please remember to keep that family in your prayers well. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this evening, I uh, believe we're singing a song. If you will, make your way uh, out the back uh, and to my left, uh, down the hallway to our library. There will be somebody there uh, to see that you are served, and we want to invite everybody back this Wednesday to our services at 7. Our closing song this evening will be number 937. If you would please stand, number 937, we will sing this through one time and then we will have our closing prayer. <clears throat> thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for uh, the time that we've had here today, for the lessons that we've heard. Uh, we ask that we would all use them as we uh, leave here and go into our week this week uh, and use it to grow in our faith. Lord, we lift up those on our prayer list that you would be with them. Uh, we ask that you would uh, be with everybody here as we leave here and go into our week and that you would bring us all back Wednesday. Uh, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you've given us. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>